In this presentation, I will investigate integrals of the kind shown here, in which the integrand consists of a constant divided by linear function of either sine or cosine. The a and b are also to be regarded as constants. As they stand at present, the integrals have an integration range along the real line from 0 to 2 pi. We will introduce a complex variable z and make a substitution in these integrals. In doing that we will find that the new contour is simply the unit circle in the complex plane. The unit circle is a closed curve and so we'll be interested in finding the poles of the integrand inside that curve. We can then use the residues at those poles and Cauchy's residue theorem to evaluate the integrals. All that is to follow, but there's something important we must do first. Whenever you're presented with a new integral, you have to ask the question, does it actually exist? Can it be evaluated? This is particularly important when we see a quotient in the integral. A quotient has a denominator, and if a denominator is zero, then we have problems. The integral can't be evaluated. Let's focus on the second one, with a plus b cos theta. The other one will work similarly with the sine. We're worried about whether a plus b cos theta might be zero somewhere for theta between zero and two pi. Let's think about what values cos takes between zero and two pi. As theta runs from zero to two pi, cos theta can take all possible values from minus one to one inclusive. If any one of those values of cos theta causes the denominator to be zero, then the integral is in trouble. Let's now look at that denominator and set it equal to zero and see what that tells us. Setting a plus b cos theta equal to zero and solving for cos gives cos equals negative a on b. If negative a on b has a value between negative one and one inclusive, then the integral is not defined. For negative a on b to be between minus one and one means that the magnitude or size of a is less than or equal to that of b. That condition must not be allowed for a and b. The simplest way of saying that is simply to say that the absolute value of a must be greater than that of b. If it's less than or equal to that of b then the integral is undefined. So in the examples that we'll eventually do we will have to make sure that the a is bigger than the b in absolute value. Let's just remember that and move on to something else. Here I have drawn for you a unit circle in the complex plane. I've drawn on a radius and shown where it intersects the circle at the point cos theta sine theta. For points z on the circle remember we could write z equals cos theta plus j sine theta but remember also that we often abbreviate that as cis theta and more importantly that it can be written as e to the power of j theta. It's this last version that we will find very useful. All points z on the circle are exactly a distance one from the origin so we could write the equation of the circle as modulus of z equals one. Let's put that on. As theta varies starting at zero and going right round one revolution until two pi, we completely traverse the circle mod z equals one. This will be relevant to our integration limits in a minute. I'm now going to make a substitution in my integral. In fact, exactly the substitution you see here. I'm going to let e to the j theta be renamed as z. Let's recall something about cos theta we have the Euler result. It says that cos theta is a half e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta. You'll recall there is a similar result for sine. I'll write it down because it's useful for the other integral that we're not yet talking about. It's 1 over 2j e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta. Let's now write down our integral and actually make the substitution. Remember the integral is integral 0 to 2 pi 
1 over a plus b cos theta d theta, where we're making the assumption that absolute value of a is bigger than that of b. And I'm going to let z equal e to the j theta. We need to change the d theta. So let's differentiate to get dz is j e to the j theta d theta. That's just normal differentiation of an exponential. And then I've cross-multiplied the d theta up to the top right. And so from that we could say that d theta is 1 over j e to the j theta dz. But of course e to the j theta is z, so that's just 1 over j z dz. So far so good. That will enable us to get rid of the d theta and turn it into dz's. Now what about a plus b cos theta? Well we've got an expression for cos theta above, the Euler expression. Let's write it down again. But in writing it down, let's remember that e to the j theta is z. So cos theta actually is a half e to the j theta is z, but e to the negative j theta, well, the negative is just a negative power, and so it's going to make 1 over z. So we can now rewrite our integral completely. It becomes the integral 1 over a plus a half b z plus 1 over z, that's the cos theta part, and there's the d theta part, which is 1 over j z dz. What about the integration limits? Well, remember the unit circle. As theta runs from 2 pi, from 0 to 2 pi, z runs around the unit circle. So it's a closed path integral around the path where mod z equals 1. This is the result we want. This is the result that will enable us to use the residue theorem. But we need to tidy it up a bit first. To begin with, there's a 1 over j there. 1 over j is a constant and is equal to just negative j. So we could take that outside, out the front. That leaves just a dz and a 1 on top and there's also a z underneath, all multiplied by a plus the half b, z plus 1 over z. Let's multiply out the brackets on the bottom. That will be minus j around mod z equals 1, 1 over, and we'll have a z plus b over 2z squared plus, now z times 1 over z of course is 1, so just b over 2 dz. It's not so nice having halves on the bottom, so let's multiply top and bottom by 2. So that will make minus 2j, that's the 2 on the top, and I've taken it outside, leaving still 1 inside, and on the bottom we multiply by 2, and let's also reorder the terms so that it's clearly a quadratic. So we'll have b z squared plus 2a z plus b dz. We could now find the zeros of that quadratic. The zeros will tell us where the poles for the function are. If any of them are inside the circle mod z equals 1, then we can use the residue theorem to find the residue at the appropriate pole and we will get a value for our integral. I'm going to stop here, but in a separate presentation we will actually do one or two of these integrals with some specific choices of A and B.